Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and to consult with staff, consultants, and other individuals about pending or potential litigation. All right. And we had a closed session right before this open session. Uh, administrative item, um, we've got, a, has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes? I'd like to make an approval for the agenda that's in front of us. Second. Okay. We have a motion to second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Is it, now has everybody had a chance to review the, uh, the minutes? From closed and open sessions between February 1st, February 1st, 2023, and February 22nd, 2023. Yes. Mr. President, okay. I'd make a motion that we approve the minutes for February 1st, close and open, February 8th, close and open, and February 22nd, close and open. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, um, awards. All right, awesome. Dr. Salem. Yes. That's invite up Bridget Passon and Cheryl Cox, please. Ms. Passon is our supervisor of English language arts, and Ms. Cox also um, is in charge of lots of different things. Um, <laughs> 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 Can you turn it up? It's not working. Okay. Better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I couldn't hear it, so. So the first award that we're going to do this evening, this award is given to a staff member or volunteer who keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial, Mr. Chip Brittingham, if you'll please come forward, and Mr. Wayne Humphreys as well, come forward. <clears throat> so this Energizer Bunny Award is going to go to Jennifer Osborne, if she'll please come forward. <clears throat> Jennifer is the reading specialist at Mattapique Elementary School. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is very lucky to have Ms. Osborne, who is an incredible champion for literacy. Ms. Osborne's primary responsibility is as a reading specialist at Mattapique Elementary School. In this role, Ms. Osborne works with students to improve their foundation and comprehension skills, as well as supports the implementation and instruction during reading English language arts blocks. But Ms. Osborne's expertise also stretches across the country, county, excuse me, and around the state, and maybe the country too. <laughs> For example, a most recent week in the life of Ms. Osborne went as follows. From Friday to Sunday, Ms. Osborne, a doctoral candidate student for Salisbury University, attended a weekend retreat along with her other SU doctoral candidates to complete a summit, the to complete and submit their first three chapters of their dissertation. So kudos to you, because I have been there. <laughs> and on Monday, Ms. Osborne led district-wide RELA uh, professional development for K through two students in which she taught teachers to connect language standards to student writing. And then on Wednesday, Ms. Osborne attended a language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling letters training for the Maryland State Department of Education in order to become a facilitator for our county. This training provides teachers from all parts of the state with the skills they need to master the fun fundamentals of reading instruction, namely phonemical awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and written language. As you can see, Ms. Osborne keeps going and going and going, which is why Ms. Cox and Ms. Passon believe that she is most deserving of the Energizer Bunny Award. So congratulations. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Completing everything. 
The next award is the Shining Star Award. This award recognizes individuals in our school's system who shine, and again, nominated by both Ms. Passon and Mrs. Cox. Um, and I'm going to read it first, and then we're gonna invite our um, award winners up. So tonight, the ELA supervisor, both of their sub supervisors, will request that the board allow for a 30-day read of a new pre-K-5 reading program. In order to ensure we selected the very best possible product for our students and teachers, we needed teachers to pilot these products. So in the spring of 2022, elementary school teachers were surveyed to determine who would be willing to pilot two products during the RELA blocks in the 22-23 school year, and 19 teachers rose to that occasion. And over the course of the past six months, each of these teachers has implemented at least two potential programs. Some of these teachers requested to pilot all three. They attended training sessions to learn the programs and implemented them with their current students in order to determine the best product. And later tonight, we will be providing you with the final decision. So stay tuned, right? <laughs> However, at this moment in time, we would like to recognize the 19 teachers who are truly shining stars. They individually and collectively shine as bright as can be to lead Queen Anne's County Public Schools to improve literacy for all elementary students. Can I call your name? Come on up. Kelly L. Lund. Elm Lund. <laughs> Kim Fulton. I don't think she's here tonight, but Kim Fulton. <laughs> Sherry Woodfield. <laughs> Sherry Woodfield. <laughs> Danielle Wilson. Jill Gill. Aaron DeSantos. Michelle Lewis. Kristen Harper. Janice Seiden. Michelle Patterson. Eliz Elizabeth McNamee, <laughs> Stephanie Grottendick, <laughs> Dawn Kelly, <laughs> Amy Taylor, <laughs> Deirdre Bildenstein, <laughs> Carrie Lisboa. Alice Tickler. I don't think she's not. Oh, sorry. Everybody switching up. They just took them. That's you. So, one more round of applause for these wonderful teachers. Last award this evening is our Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Our March Spirit Award winner is Jennifer Joffrey. If she'll please come forward. <laughs> Ms. Joffrey is an English teacher at Queen Anne's County High School. However, her talent and expertise 
have profound impacts on literacy and learning for all high school students. Not only is Ms. Joffrey, a, and, excuse me, not only is she a dynamic teacher in her daily role at Queen Anne's County High School, but she has also dedicated after school time and summer hours to writing English two curriculum, honors English two curriculum, English four curriculum, and so forth. Ms. Joffrey was also critical in reimagining how we implement a reading enrichment course that benefits our high school students. She has attended several national conferences and has used her learning to develop professional development for both middle school ELA teachers and high school English teachers. Her professional development has also been relevant, providing teachers with cognitive engagement strategies or activities that can be immediately applied in order to improve reading and or writing in the classrooms. Ms. Joffrey is scholarly, compassionate, and driven, and thereby truly embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. We are so grateful that she is part of our school team. Congratulations. for coming. Thank you always. Thank you always. I'm hanging Thank you always. One day at a time. So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all you guys doing. Thank you. Thank you guys for doing that every time. I really thinned out the crowd. Yeah. Then. All right. Next thing on our agenda is board uh, and staff involvement. Um, would any of the board members like to be recognized? Well, I'd like to bring up a subject. Saturday morning, I received a call from a good friend of mine. Matter of fact, his daughter sat next to me as a student member about three years ago about an incident down at Parkside. He showed me a face screen of this, which was posted on Facebook, which was very disturbing. Channel 47 ABC wrote this. It was incorrect. That morning, I called Dr. Salins. She got back to me within a couple hours in a short summary. Mr. Pinder got back to me that evening with a very detailed summary. And his board has had a very detailed update on this. It was false. It was misleading. I can't see how Channel 47 ABC even published something like this. I want to warn people not to publish things that you see unless you know the facts. And we have people that can give you the facts. It's disturbing, and I think this board is in lock sync that we will instruct our staff to pursue this, to straighten this issue out, both with the other school and even the state board, because this is untrue, and there was a lot of things misleading, and it's very heartening to see our students have to be put through this. And that, that's the thing I have to say about that. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith. Anyone else? Um, a little bit of uh, February was a very busy month for a lot of us. Um, we did the ESMEC data walk where we got to see the state's project information about our schools, our students, how we're doing. There's all sorts of things, heat maps for um, 
learning um, by all different categories. It was really informative. It was the second time I'd seen it, but a couple of us got to it for the first time. Um, there was also the African American Heritage Night, which Mr. Schifanelli and I participated in. That was really good. It was community driven. Um, it was a very good activity and some pretty good food. Um, and then there's been a lot of reading this month at many of the elementary schools. And I appreciate Bayside, Sudlersville, and Graysonville because they kept me rolling. And don't let anybody tell you, second, third, and fourth graders are very inquisitive. They will ask you all kinds of questions. And just so the board knows, the most important question I got was if we actually paid for the mathematics books. And I had to tell them, no, we don't buy them specifically. We make it funds available so that they can be bought. So there's all the activities for the month. I'm taking March off, just so you know. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yep, Shannon's right. Uh, we uh, wrapped up uh, Black History Month this past month. Um, I did attend that uh, function there at Southersville Middle School, and it was very, very much fun. I also went out to uh, Graysonville Elementary School for their uh, yes. uh, African American History Living Museum, which was very interesting and, and so much fun. It's always fun to be with those those uh, littles in the, in the elementary school level and, and of course the middle school too. But um, the one thing I liked about uh, the Living History or the Living Wax Museum mm -hmm. was that, uh, you know, usually during Black History Month, we certainly celebrate black leaders, uh, American leaders, Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, um, uh, black American heroes like Rosa Parks, um, very well-known figures in history. Uh, at the Living Wax Museum, I was, uh, able to hear uh, the students presenting uh, um, uh, about characters or, or black American figures in history that are not so well known. Um, some of the first ones that uh, made flights across the United States or uh, um, heroes like uh, Dory Miller uh, from World War II, the first uh, black American to earn the Navy Cross, which is right below the Medal of Honor. Um, so it was very interesting uh, and fun uh, event over there. So um, kudos to all the schools because they were all the schools were having um, uh, age appropriate um, celebrations of Black History Month. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, Ms. Bennett, she's not here tonight, but she uh, went around to a lot of classes uh, I heard and did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so thank her for that. Let's see, student board members. Um, Austin, did you have something, Mr. Smith? No, I didn't. Oh, no, I'm good. I just did the data walk with um, Shannon, and I'm actually looking very forward to the musicals coming up this weekend and next weekend, so. <laughs> All right. Austin, you're on. Mr. Uh, Johnson's out tonight, but I believe we have a statement that he wanted us to read, but... <laughs> I'll go ahead and take Austin, the floor first. <laughs> um, so looking at the month of March, spring sports tryouts were today. Uh, I actually just came from a practice myself, so... You know, we're rolling back into spring sports. We're excited. We're ready to, to beat Ken Island more and more and more. So uh, he's unfortunately not here, so he can't see his reaction. So, um, so we are also excited about the musicals that are coming up. We are hosting The Wizard of Oz, as you said, next weekend and the following weekend. And on 3-9, um, uh, March the 9th, CMS, CES, CES, no, sorry, SES, Basically, all of the elementary schools are going to be sending their students to attend the show. Uh, almost 600 students are going to be in the auditorium watching and enjoying what we have to offer as a performing arts department. So we're really excited for that. Um, on the 13th, HBCU, there will be a college expo presentation. About 30 students from CMS will also participate. This is an African-American college that is looking to help out those in our community. Um, we're taking the spring ASVAP on the 16th. On the 17th, as we grow closer and closer to graduation, Jocelyn's will be at Queens County High School for graduation announcements, pictures, um, and, and passing out gowns and all that. So please you know, make sure your student's there to pick up all that stuff. Uh, we're having SAT's testing day on the 22nd. And surprisingly, on the 29th, the quarter ends. So we're almost three quarters of the way through the year. Uh, it's kind of scary as a senior to almost be, you know, done. Yeah. Um, and 
So now going back on to February, we had a great basketball season as we have just beat Easton 62 to 52 yesterday. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised that when the national anthem was not able to be played over the speakers, that the student section all came together and sang it. So I'm sure there's a video out there surfacing the web. It's really heartwarming to see. So I suggest if anybody can get that, you know, to show it around and such. So. That's pretty Excellent. cool. Thank you. Mr. Pender's going to provide this. I'm, oh, I'm okay. filling in for uh, Mr. Johnson tonight. I'm kind of excited <laughs> who was going to do that. I get to go back 30 some years back to high school again for my senior year. Um, he, there was a lot of things going on at uh, Ken Allen High School. Um, on Friday, February 3rd, scheduling for the 2023-2024 school year began. Um, students met with their counselors throughout the month to review their request to ensure that the requested courses would keep them on track for graduation. On Wednesday, February 8th, Money for College Night was held in the auditorium. Uh, the event was geared towards juniors, seniors, and their parents. Financial aid topics included the FAFSA, grants, school loans, and scholarships. On Friday, February 10th, our National Iron Society and the EDGE sponsored a dodgeball tournament for the benefit of the Jacob Sloan Foundation. On Wednesday, February 22nd, spring sports orientation was held in the auditorium. Athletes broke into individual meeting groups and met with their coaches of their respective sports. On Friday, February 24th, SGA held a blood drive. Students had the opportunity to save three lives with one pint of blood and earn a service learning credit. Quarter three interim reports were sent home on Friday 24th. They determined whether students would be eligible to participate in spring sports as well as some Ken Island High School activities. For sports, as usual, the athletes at Ken Island High School have continued to show up and show out at their sports events. Our unified strength and conditioning team traveled to Snow Hill for their state championship and finished in second place. Last Saturday, the JV team traveled to Ocean City for a statewide competition and finished first. Our wrestling team competed in a tournament at Queen Anne's last Saturday. Giuseppe Mellinger won his weight class for wrestling at the Bayside Championship. Jack Hooks, Greg Couch, Couch sorry, and both Lily and Giuseppe Mellinger will all be going to the state championship. Our boys swim team won the regional championship for the first time in Ken Allen High School history with, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce the names here, um, Kaden Latchall, Rachel Rickaball, and Cameron Sedora placing at the states. Several participants on our indoor track team were named regional and state champions, and many of them set new school records. Our Lady Bucks remain undefeated in basketball and play tonight for a regional championship. Um, coming up, school day, SAT will take place on Wednesday, March 22nd at Kenlon High School. Juniors are ready and registered for the test and it is offered free of charge to all juniors in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. If juniors are looking to prepare for the SAT, the Khan Academy offers free individualized practice. Quarter three ends on Wednesday, March 29th, and report cards for the quarter will be sent home on Friday, April 14th, once we return from spring break. Last but not least, the Adams Family Show opens this Friday and will continue to run uh, through next weekend. Show times are Friday and Saturday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 2 p.m. Tickets for the show are available right now at our school website. Get them while they last. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for letting me be back in 12th grade for about two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Dr. Salins. Yes, so we had a surprise visit from the governor, and it was amazing. Awesome. Yes, yeah. and so he was so genuine. Um, he was actually here in Queen Anne's County for a different um, reason, um, celebrating African American History Month. And, um, but was right next to Kennard and he said he just couldn't take it. He needed to go in and see a classroom. So he came in, he was just as wonderful with our students, engaging with them um, and has promised them all that they will be invited to his home to take a tour. So I said, only if their superintendent can, can go with them. So, I mean, we were in the schools all, all, it was a very busy month, but I would have to say that just, just meeting him and seeing how genuine he is was certainly a highlight for me. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is I had an opportunity this month to go um, and represent Queen Anne's County as the superintendent of the year for the state of Maryland. It was quite an honor and really a big deal. And I wanted to share with the board that um, I was able to to uh, receive this medal on behalf of our, our district and um, and this plaque on behalf of us. So 
So I'm really excited to share that with you. And I just wanted to personally say thank you for giving me the opportunity to go represent our district. And, and it was really, it was really awesome. So thank you for that opportunity. All right. And congratulations again. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> That's, all I got. That's it. All right. I'm sure. Dr. Sprankle. Good evening, everyone. President Schiffinelli. Good evening. I would say board members, Dr. Salins, and executive team members. For the record, I am Marcia Sprinkle. I am the assistant superintendent here. So now we are going to take a look at our February highlights. So let's take a look to see what we were doing in February because February was an extremely busy month. Yes. I do want to say that. And board members alone, you have been busy. <laughs> I mean, you have really been busy, but you've stolen my thunder, but I won't hold you responsible <laughs> for that. So I'll get going. Okay. Here we go at Bayside Elementary School. Bayside Elementary School held a STEAM night. It was well attended by families and students who engaged in special STEAM activities. And there were a lot of activities that night. So there you can see pictured the students at various stations completing STEAM activities. So there we go, Bayside Elementary School. Next, we'll move on to Churchill Elementary School. Little bit of trivia here. Once a century, the date and the zip code will match. February 16th, 2023 was the day in Church Hill, Maryland, 2-16-23 actually matched. <laughs> Students decorated postcards to let the community know how much they were appreciated as well on that special day. So there we go at Churchill Elementary School. They have like a mail program going on at, El at Churchill Elementary School. It's a popular thing that they do. I know that every time I visit Churchill Elementary School, um, Doc, I will say that Miss Walbert. Miss Walbert talks about it all the time. So here we go, Churchill Elementary School. Congratulations on your delivery program down there at Churchill. Next, we have Kent Island Elementary School. Reminiscing about the past and admiring our future retired educators from Queen Anne's County and Anne Arundel, along with students from Stevensville Middle School, read to Kent Island Elementary School students in celebration of Black History Month. So thank you so much for all of our special volunteers who read this last month at Kent Island Elementary School. Next, we have Mattapique Elementary School. Mattapique Elementary School had a busy month. They had guest readers and speakers that included the Two Fairy, Sam Drazen, and other special guests. Kindness was spread throughout the school. Fifth graders performed their first play last month. Congratulations, fifth grade students. Next, we have Settlersville Elementary School. February was filled with love and kindness at Sellersville Elementary School. On February 14th, students participated on Friendship Day and Friendship Day activities provided by the PTA. We just love our PTAs at all of our schools. Students received a book from Symphony Village and enjoyed team building activities. Ms. Bent also visited and read to two classes at Sellersville Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Bent. Mattapique Middle School, Queen Anne's County Department of Health joined eighth grade students during lunch at Mattapique Middle School to play drug and alcohol prevention, Plinko. Students received prizes for their participation. Pictured is this month's Win the Day Challenge winner. And there you can see that winner with their special shirt. Congratulations. Again, we have Settlersville Middle School. Settlersville Middle School had a lot happening down there. Settlersville Middle School celebrated African-American History Month. 
And let me tell you, the families and the community members enjoyed the African-American cuisines. I hope, Ms. Bent and Mr. Schifanelli, you try some of those African-American cuisines. I tried it all. Okay, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. They were really um, good. I know Mr. Watkins <laughs> says he was going to try as well. There you go. Here are more pictures from African-American History Month from Settlersville Middle School, as you can see. The school welcomed members from the African-American community to come in and to read. And you can see Mr. Watkins over there, which is great. Seventh and eighth grade students read the lyrics of the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a prideful African-American. It's our anthem song. So they celebrate it by reading that song. So thank you so much for remembering Settlersville Middle School students. Queen Anne's County High School. Queen Anne's County High School staff wore red for National American Heart Month, which is really important. Queen Anne's County High School is raising awareness by offering staff two free CPR certification courses this month. The goal is to have 100% of the staff CPR certified by the end of the school year. The nursing students are also raising awareness by sharing healthy recipes and the program for the academic and community success students learn how to measure their pulse. Congratulations, PAC students. Congratulations to Queen Anne's County High School visual arts teacher, Stephanie Zeiler. She was selected by her peers to receive the Outstanding National Art Honor Society Sponsor uh, Award which was, will be presented in April to her in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for really supporting and also bringing out our county and being recognized in San Antonio, Texas. So thank you, Stephanie. Next, which Dr. Salen's already talked about this, we had some excitement here in small Queen Anne's County public schools. We had Maryland's governor, Wes Moore, and Maryland State Senator Stephen Hersey, who surprised Kennard Elementary School students with a special visit. And you can see those high fives, and you can see uh, Dr. Salen's up there, uh, along with our governor. So that is just wonderful. It was a wonderful experience for our students and our staff, and I also think that Dr. Sale is really like that visit yeah. as well. It was on she Valentine's Day too. You can see all the students are in red. <laughs> so what a what a cool experience on amazing, Valentine's Day. For our amazing, students. amazing, amazing. Next, we have Graysonville Elementary School, the Living Wax Museum of Black American Leaders. I believe Mr. Schifanelli talked about this a little bit earlier, and as you can see, we had Mr. Smith present as well as Ms. Bennett, also Mrs. Bennett. And there you go, Mr. Schifanelli. You're also there interacting. Thank you so much, board members, and also Graysonville Elementary School students for such a wonderful living museum, wax museum, I should say. Kennard Student Council visited Corsica Hills. What a special trip. Ms. Borga of Kennard Elementary School applied for and received a grant from the Queen Anne's County Retired School Personnel Association that allowed fifth grade students to visit and deliver care packages to the residents of Corsica Hills. So thank you so much, students at Kennard Elementary School, for being so kind. February was the month of kindness. So. Here we go. And on that note, I think we'll just close out there. <laughs> Perfect way to close out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sprankle. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have uh, citizen participation and comment, public comment. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone numbers and address. Comments should be limited three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about the actions or statements of individuals, staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely 
but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First on the list is Barbara Young. You may sit, and uh, if you don't mind sitting your uh, name and address for the record. Of course. Um, my name is Barbara Young. My address is 300 Recovery Drive, Centerville. All right, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. I'm speaking today regarding my concerns about new directives that were given to teachers in August 2022 review of the material of instruction policies. These directives have taken away the options for students to read a book from home silently during small breaks in classroom instruction time, has reduced school library access and ELA instruction at the middle and high school levels to only 15 minutes a month per class, and instructed teachers to remove from their classrooms any non-board approved materials a teacher might use to complement and enhance the curriculum. These new directives have not been relayed to parents. My child loves to read. We encourage a love for reading at home. I am disheartened and confused as to why my child would be told he cannot read a book home from home silently if he has finished a test before other students or if there are three minutes left in the class period. In the middle and high school levels, if a student visits a library and picks out a book that they are excited to start reading, they can no longer open this book when back in the classroom. How can it be okay in an educational setting to send to a student the confusing message, we want you to read, but only do so on your own time? I am also disheartened that teachers have been restricted in allowing additional exploration and access to resources outside the curriculum that could enhance their learning experience. I start with the basis of trust in my child's teacher, believing that teachers have good intentions for my child to have a full and diverse educational experience. If a teacher offers, offers a resource that I am not comfortable with, I can have a sensible conversation with them, asking for an alternative option. I believe the spirit of collaboration with teachers creates the best environment for my teacher to get the most, for my child to get the most out of their education. If there are parents that have concerns about their child's access to materials at school, would it be possible to have an opt-in, opt-out option where a parent could opt out of their child going to the school library, could opt out of free choice silent reading in class, and opt out of compl complimentary resources being offered to their child? I suggest this as an alternative, instead of limiting my choice as a parent for my child to have access to such resources. I respectfully ask the board and school administrators to reconsider the current implementation of this policy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, before the next speaker comes up, um, is this something that we may want to put on an open session sometime in the future? Because I'm really unaware of the policy, or, or is this policy in effect? Is it a directive? So that, that the policy can't... is not new at all. And the... is it, public forum time? Let, let, it is. We'll, we'll let you speak. But we're. Other we're... Here to speak. Oh, of course, and and they'll have their chance. Um, I, I think we should discuss this as a board after we hear everybody's input. Yeah. Okay. No well, that's fine. Uh, next speaker, Donna Edward. Good evening. My name is Donna Edward. I'm relatively new to Queen Anne's County, but I taught for 40 plus years over in Anne Arundel and other states throughout the country. Um, I'm part of the group that has learned about this recent, um, well, I guess I don't know how recent it is, but um, about the books issue. And uh, basically I was a teacher of infants and toddlers and deaf and hard of hearing infants and toddlers. And the first thing we learned and we taught parents with newborns is read to them. Read whatever you want, read the label of something, read, you know, show them that you read and read 
it to them. So reading is at the core of what I've done for the last 40 some years. Um, I know that in, with deaf and hard of hearing children, they often have barriers to learning, to access to communication, to understanding the written word. So we do anything and everything to open that world to them. And I just feel that um, you, you need to have the teacher's expertise involved in selecting what will work for a child. Every child's unique. Some child may want to read the directions to a recipe. Some child may want to read about superheroes. But teachers have the, the education and the learning to, to know how you have to diversify for every child that you're with. And I just feel that, you know, the schools that allow a more diverse experience of books and literature are the ones where children excel and where they learn more and more. So I, I found a little quote, I don't know if banning books is the word to use, but banning books gives silence when we need speech. It closes our ears when we need to listen and it makes us blind when we need to see. So I just hope um, with input from teachers and the public that the limitation of reading materials is something of the past. <laughs> Thank you. Kim Klein. Good evening, my name is Kimberly Klein and I live at 200 Elm Street in Centerville with my two children that attend Kennard Elementary School. And I'm here to speak about the possible stricter implementation of code 620 and 620.1 regarding the books. My family are avid readers. We have a very diverse library at our home. My children are very fortunate to have access to a variety of books at our house that they can go upstairs at any time and choose from but not all children have this luxury. A lot of children rely on the books that they have in their classrooms or in the media center to have any type of variety of reading materials, whether at home or in the classroom. And as a parent, I fully trust my child's teacher to have age-appropriate, sensible books in their classroom libraries. I have gone to some of their teachers already this year and in the past asking for book recommendations or different types of material recommendations. The teachers spent a lot of time and a lot of their own personal money to build their personal libraries so their students have access to a variety of books that interest them and what is popular at the time. If there is a parent or even a handful of parents who firmly disagree on what is in a teacher's library bookshelf, then why can't that, that parent just go in and sensibly talk to the teacher and request that their child not be exposed to a certain book or, or a series of books? Removing all students' access to non-board approved books is equal to punishing an entire class due to one student misbehaving. I am all for parental choice and involvement, but it must be viewed by both ways. And the short amount of time that students have for free choice reading gives them a mini mental break. It allows them to do something they enjoy and relax before moving on to the next subject. If students finish their classwork early and use the gap to read, what's the problem with that? It teaches them self-regulation and patience. Free choice reading is a reward for students who finish early. Giving them more work is not an incentive. As a parent, I do not accept that my child would not be allowed to bring their book from home in order to read during gap time. They should not be told they can't read a book from home because I approve that book, even if the board does not. So I respectfully ask that you consider allowing teachers to keep all of their books they have spent years accumulating so that all students in the classroom may continue to enjoy them in their downtime. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Blanton. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Good to see your name and your address. 
Chris Bland and right. Church Hill. Um, I'm just going to kind of continue on what I was talking about last week because my time got cut off, so nothing specific. Um, so what I'm talking about is, again, school safety and how we need better infrastructure. School shootings have been going on for over 300 years. School shootings are not new. The only difference is that the frequency in which they occur. During the school safety, uh, safety meeting, the superintendent stated that since these buildings were built in the 50s, they were built for the school shootings. They weren't built for the school shootings that occur today. While I don't blame the superintendent for the way in which the schools were built, I am tired of hearing excuses. The fact is that school shootings have been going on for over 300 years, so it is well before these schools were built. We don't want excuses, we want results. I don't want your apologies, I want your commitment that we're gonna make our schools safe. I can assure you I will not be silenced until we can send our kids to school and know that they are truly safe. During COVID, we had law enforcement sitting out, out here during COVID because of the parents. We should have law enforcement at every school. Now we're gonna build a $20 million, or almost $20 million board of education building. For what? We have trailers that our kids are learning in. We have trailers that our kids, are, that our teachers are teaching in. They were supposed to be per, or temporary at one point and they've turned permanent. And now we're sitting here adding more trailers at the last meeting. And I'm a little appalled that Mr. Smith can unequivocally say that these schools are safe after I advise you of something that yeah, we had already, we, Mr. Bland, that you just didn't know about. Stop the clock, what you said. If, just stop the clock, I'll give you your time. So out of respect, to everybody here because when you single out a board member, whether it's me or somebody else, and you right. criticize me or something that I did, whatever, I'm not allowed to speak afterwards. So I really can't defend myself, right? Because we don't want to get into this conversation because then it, it takes a long time. So if you do have a problem with uh, or a concern with a particular member, you can email that member, you can email me as president, uh, whatever you want to do, and we can make sure that we, you know, address that that issue. I, but, I, and I and I can I can live by that, but I was definitely after I left, comments were made. So I'm not allowed to defend myself after I leave either. So I agree with you on that, but I was not allowed to defend myself either when I, when when I left. I'm not sure if anybody statement. attacked you, Mr. Plant. No, but you, made but a okay. that you, you understand my I, point, I got you. right? I got you. you. Go ahead, Sid, you can start again. Okay. So again, we're building a twenty million dollar building or almost twenty million dollar building. And again, we have schools that need better infrastructure. I don't care where the money's coming from. Every time I ask, can we do this? Can we do that? We get told, we don't have the money. Where's the money coming from? But now we're building a clubhouse. We're building an ivory tower for what, 75 employees? How many employees and how many students are at these schools that that $20 million or 14 or $17 million could be better invested in than a board of education building? We have temporary buildings. Tell you what, buy a cornfield, put those temporary buildings in a cornfield, there's your new Board of Education building. I saved you millions of dollars. So please look into something like that. Let's get these kids in classes, in actual learning environments, and not outside in a temporary trailer. Please. Thank you. All right, thank you. Katherine Cooper. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, Catherine Cooper, 7109 2nd Avenue, Queenstown. Um, I'm here in solidarity with my friends who alerted me to the reading policy, which I understand, you know, perhaps we don't fully understand what it is, and I'm hoping that we get some clarity that reassures us. Um, but I, it, just for a little context, I grew up here. My parents are retired educators. I know Mr. Smith. I know Mr. Pinder. I know a lot of the teachers that were here in honor tonight, and I love it here. I lived in Baltimore for 14 years with my husband, who I unfortunately misled into signing up, so he'll be speaking next. I'm sure he'll agree with everything I, I have said here tonight. But um, I, you know, I love this community, and I love the smallness and the accountability that we have to one another. And I really hope that this reading policy, whatever it turns out to be doesn't divide us further because I really love living here and I'm sure we all have very different politics, but um, I don't wanna regret the decision to come back home and raise my kids here. Um, and I just will spare you your evenings as it gets late and just share one little vignette about the importance of reading to my family. Um, my oldest daughter is in fifth grade. She's a wonderful kid, extremely curious, but highly anxious and was sort of a late reader, I think because she felt like she wasn't good at it. She got to Canard and had two of the most fantastic teachers, including one this year who just gets my child and was able to recommend to her books 
that she thought my daughter would really enjoy, and she has. For the first time, she's brought some books home that her teacher recommended, and these are middle grade books that I would never have known about. She recognized what my daughter was interested in. She was able to say, this is a book that's gonna spark your interest, and it has. And I can't tell you how magical that has been for my daughter. Not only do I feel like she might be okay academically, but the social emotional piece of feeling like seen by your teacher has been huge. And so, you know, I, I also with parents that were teachers that devoted their lives to this educational system, to say that we can't trust teachers to bring their expertise to bear with our kids in terms of reading materials is, is really disheartening. And so I do hope that if this policy that we think is, you know, being implemented in the way we think it is, you know, I hope you'll you'll reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Colin? You're up. <laughs> uh, my name is Colin Kassler. I live seven seven one zero nine Second Avenue, Queenstown, Maryland. Good evening. Um, I have no uh, prepared comment. I just want to state my support on the record for Miss Young, Miss Klein, Miss Edwards, and my wife, of course. So that's all I have. All right. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Marla Hosey Moss. My name is Marla Posey Moss. I'm the president of Free State PTA, the official PTA representing national PTA in the state of Maryland. Our office is in Baltimore County, but I'm a resident of Harper County. So thank you. I appreciate your welcome, Chair Schifanelli and Superintendent Dr. Salins for having me today and Board of Education members, thank you. I'm actually here to visit with you all today to associate a name with the base for the new state PTA Congress and enlighten you on a PTA perspective from the state and more specifically, Free State PTA legislative agenda and dates of interest and highlight some legislative positions which I hope you received by email today. First, I would like to share with you what distinguishes PTA from other parent groups, especially since all PTAs are nonprofits and are membership-based advocacy associations. As the largest child advocacy association in Maryland of over 50,000 members, the Free State PTA values collaboration, commitment, diversity, respect, and accountability. The state PTA works with constituent PTAs on a myriad of professional business expectations, ranging from leadership training, adherence to financial guidelines and governance documents such as bylaws, promotion of partnerships within the school community, maintaining insurance and tax filings, and administration of programs and grant funding that promote family engagement, the arts, health and safety, literacy, and a host of other parent interests that contributes to a positive school climate. A critical component that underlies our work as a PTA family is in diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. The PTA realizes that strong education that considers DEI helps children, their families, and school communities be successful. Moreover, a quality education is attained when diverse voices, perspectives, and experiences are infused in acquiring knowledge and learning in the classroom, executing policies and procedures, and conducting professional development. Additionally, achievement is improved when the implementation of education is tailored with the proper resources to meet the needs of students. That is equity. The mission of PTA is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Membership to PTA is always open to anyone who believes in the purposes and values of PTA, and this includes individuals who do not have children to parents and guardians of non-public school students, and to members of the community, and of course yourselves as policymakers. Some of the legislative testimony I wanna let you all know that we've supported include HB 185, non-public schools and child care providers, corporal punishment prohibition, the Youth Equity and Safety Act, which prevents children from being charged as adults, school buildings, solar technology, solar panels on schools, House Bill 300, Teacher Certification Program Implementation and Study, House Bill 56, and Pesticide Registration, PFAs Testing Requirements, Senate Bill 158, and a ton of others. 
We look forward to giving you an invitation to our convention from July 28th to July 30th. And thank you again for inviting me and having me here today. All right. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. At this time, we have two names that were removed from the list. Is there anyone else that would like to sign up for public comment? All right, going once, going twice. So, all right. So, before we get into information items, um, what I'm understanding is it's policy 620 and regulation yeah. 620. I'm, I'm happy to have um, our supervisor come, you know, to even the next meeting to do a presentation to share with the board what the policy is and how sure, we're implementing the policy. I said, I'm happy to have our supervisor, Ms. Passon, come to our next board meeting to clarify the policy for our board members. Of course, this is an open public session, so anybody's welcome to come back and listen, but I'm sure she'd be happy to do that, come and talk about the policy, talk about um, the guidelines within the policy and how we are implementing the policy throughout Queen Anne's County Public Schools. All right. I I think that would be a great idea. Um, we'll have a chance to look at it in the meantime as well. Yeah, sure. And uh, I mean, so if you can put that on the agenda for next time. You know, I jotted down some notes, obviously, because I could sit here and share a lot of information, sure. but I think that it would be better to have um, Ms. Passing come with oh, a yeah. formal presentation to the board. Obviously, this is a concern for parents. There's some clarification that needs to Certainly. happen. So I think a, a more prepared um, opportunity would be more beneficial. And that will be on our Let's April meeting, right? Whatever the board's purview, you know, whatever you I mean, a work prefer. session, sure. happy, whatever. Happy to accommodate. Right. Obviously, Ms. Passon's op yeah. tempo as well. So yes. as, as soon as you're, uh, as soon as we're ready. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I mean, what I like to do is make sure we get it out to the public. <clears throat> I know we post our agenda, you know, days in advance. Absolutely. But give it to the public or if anybody would like to send us an email and then we could return the email when that will be on the agenda. So, I mean, we can set the agenda now if you'd like. I'm happy. The next formal meeting is April 12th. I'm happy to have it on that agenda if that's what the board um, wishes to do. I think so. Let's do it if we can. Is that? Sure. Okay April 12th. Sure, the okay. Yes. We'll have to make sure Ms. Passon's available. Gotcha. And if she is, she's on it. Okay. She's right. good. Thank you, Ms. Passon. Thank you. Yep. All right. 6.01. Um, Ms. Cox and Ms. Passon. Materials and instruction recommendations. Is public form over? Yes. Are we able to? Oh, yeah, you can leave. Everybody's released. We can't hold you here. We encourage you to stay. We're going to talk about our English language arts program and what new programs we're going to be implementing. So you may want to stay just for the first item. Um, Thank you. Is, um, where do I submit my actual written statement? You can just give it to Mr. Pinder right there. But this is this is the actual program that your kids are going to be engaging in. You may want to stay just for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. President Chipinelli and members of the board, Dr. Salins and members of the executive team. For the record, I am Bridget Passon. I'm the English language <laughs> arts supervisor uh, for grades three through 12. Um, before I introduce you to my newest colleague, since my name has come up on the docket, um, I do want to everyone to be mindful that policy 620 exists. It came into, um, it was approved in 2018. Um, it is how we adopt all of our materials for what happens during instructional time in our classrooms. I don't own the policy. The policy isn't mine. It's a CNI policy. There was an instance that occurred that created some concern in my content. So I did not create, uh, I did not redirect anyone. I just reminded them of all the regulations that were included in the policy. Sure. Um, so hopefully you'll have a chance to look at it. I'm happy to Absolutely. come to anything to answer questions about all the particulars to put some, some clarity on the situation. Uh, but I just thought I'd be remiss if I didn't just say, that right now I'm the face of MOI because the concern happened in my content and I sought to address it um, in a manner that followed the language of the policy. Um, but I look, I'll be back hopefully, pending that you um, <clears throat> approve tonight's 30 day read, I'll hopefully be back on April 12th for an action item. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm happy to talk about the policy at that All time. All right, thank you, Ms. Paston, for that info. 
for yep. sure. You're welcome. All right. So before we go forward, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Cheryl Cox. Hi, members of the board. I'm Cheryl Cox. I am the new, new-ish okay. supervisor of instruction for early learning, language arts from pre-K through second grade, migrant education, and Title III. So here tonight, I'm wearing my language arts hat. Um, so I am here to share curriculum with Ms. Passon. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so our purpose is to provide you a brief overview of the piloting process and request that the recommended product be considered for a 30-day read. So in accordance with the policy, we followed everything in regards to selection and evaluation of these materials, but because literacy is so massive and it affects up to seven grade levels, if I'm doing my math right, um, from pre-K to grade five, um, we wanted to get the materials not only in front of teachers, but in front of kids. Um, and so last spring, we, as you heard in the, in the awards, we survey teachers to see who would be interested in piloting. Um, in regards to consumerism, it's always great to compare two things and instead of just looking at one and then voting on what you know. So we had these 19 teachers rise to the occasion with, I had one after they got the overviews of each session, ask if they could pilot all three, to which I said yes. And I thought, I better tell the other teachers if they wanna pilot all three, they can, and four more came forward. So we had a lot of great things happening across the district over the past six months to pilot um, these products. I use the keyboard. All right, so let's talk about funding. So we already have the money. Usually I'm here to ask you for money. The money already exists. It's already been, been approved. Um, per this board and our commissioners, we were given $500,000 for fiscal year 23. Um, we spent uh, close to 80 some um, to support materials in our K-5 to RELA blocks this school year. We have 417 left over for this new product. Um, in K-3, we're working with a lot of money from the LEADS grant, particularly that science of reading lever. So this, the money is already there, which is great news. <laughs> okay. Where we started to select the materials that we piloted um, is we always have to start with ed reports. So we sifted through, we looked at the big publishers, we talked to our counterparts on the shore um, and across the bridge to get ideas of what they were looking at for their literacy products. Um, but most importantly, we needed it to, at a minimum, hit the meets expectations rating on ed reports. And the three products that we selected all did. We were particularly interested in products that aligned incredibly well to the science of reading and all the components that go into the science of reading. Um, and so that was our first, our first two parts. And then we got overviews from all of our vendors. So they, they, we could make sure that they checked all, all of our initial boxes for what we want in front of our students. Our timeline went as follows. So we had about 33 instructional days with each pilot. That's a brief pilot, but it gave us enough information to make an informed decision. From September 6th to October 20th, we piloted the first product, which was from Savas. That was My View Literacy in grades K to five and three cheers in our pre-K classrooms. Then from October 24th to December 21st, we piloted Into Reading. Into Reading is only a K to five program. Um, so we looked at a different pre-K program and that was Frog Street. And then from January 2nd to February 24th, we piloted Wonders 2023 and Pre-K World of Wonders. We had the teachers vote on February 22nd so we could do all the paperwork and get everything ready for this board meeting. How did we evaluate materials? Well, we reached out to, um, I spoke to Caroline County and we, all, we also, and Worcester and Talbot. And um, Caroline County was in the middle of this process, so they gave us some great information. But of course, we reached out to the state to see what they wanted us to use to vet products. Um, and so we took a couple of important pieces of information to create our evaluation tool. Um, and the rating scale went from zero, does not meet criteria, to four, meets all criteria with strong connections between standards and lessons. So we evaluated on seven different components. Alignment to our state standards, key areas of focus, the instructional supports that were provided, assessment and measurability, science of reading, and that's primarily focused on our K-3 to grades, um, all the fancy words there that go with science of reading, phonological and phenom awareness, decoding and fluency. Um, I'm happy to admit, not happy to admit, but I have no problem admitting that I'm 46 years old and the way I was taught to read was through phonics and phonological awareness and decoding. Um, 
it's kind of everything old is new again. We're kind of in that place, but what the pandemic d did to learning and learning to read, we really had to get back to, to the foundations of it. And so there's this very important reemergence, which I'm thrilled about, of the science of reading. We also had to make sure that there were culturally responsive and equitable teaching practices, and we had to make sure that it was user friendly. So if it's okay with the board, we're gonna combine uh, agenda item 6.02, which is Frog Street with this, uh, with this agenda item 6.01. Um, and Cheryl and I will do both those pieces together, okay. and then you'll have two items ticked off by the time you're done with this. <laughs> All right. Go forward. <laughs> okay. So I have the pleasure of sharing how it went in the pre-kindergarten classrooms. We had two teachers at Churchill that piloted all three programs. They started with My View, um, moved into Frog Street, and then ended up with Wonders. So the scores are as follows. My View got a score of 80 overall. Frog Street was a 72, and Wonders was a 70. If you look at those by straight numbers, you can see that My View was the winner for that. After a lot of discussion, we met on February 22nd um, with myself, the two teachers that piloted, and my early learning facilitator, and we really broke it down. We really talked about both programs, the pros and cons of both, because they said that Frog Street was really up there, but they were really not sure which one was better. And when, as we teased out the conversation and talked about the standards and what our goals are for students in pre-K, it came out that my view was better for teachers. They liked a lot of the teacher behind the scenes pieces but the conversation led us to what was best for kids was Frog Street so even though the scores necessarily didn't pan out that way we really felt like Frog Street was the best program for our students one of the features of Frog Street that we really love um, it's a it's an integrated curriculum but it's got conscious discipline as a big piece of it embedded into it conscious discipline is really teaching our kids self-regulation how to deal with conflict, how to deal with their feelings, all of those things that four-year-olds really need to know. My view did not have any of that embedded in it, so we would have to supplement with another curriculum to get them to that place where they were ready for kindergarten and ready to manage some of the big emotions that our students have when they're four. We currently, and have been historically for several years now, been doing Frog Street and liked that piece of it. So really, as we teased out the conversation, we realized we were gonna have to pull from old curriculum to supplement new curriculum. And when we talked about Frog Street, it had everything embedded in it. So for us, it kind of became the clear winner through the conversation. Um, it's got a lot of resources in it to help our ESOL students, which we know is definitely something we need at age four. Our students at Sudlersville, a lot of them are speaking Spanish. So we really need those other pieces to help them to acquire the English skills and be ready for kindergarten. The Frog Street curriculum really is tied to our KRA, which we know is our kinder kindergarten readiness assessment. It's gonna help us prepare our students for kindergarten. So that's why through the conversation, we really got to the place where we decided can, um, Frog Street was the best for us. Move to the next slide. So this is just um, some bulleted points about Frog Street. It's got nine thematic units. Everything is integrated. So the students start off the year talking about all about me, but they're gonna talk about that in reading. They're gonna talk about that in math. They're gonna talk about through the power of play. They're gonna talk about it in STEAM. Everything is going to be integrated. One of the pieces we also really like was the at home component. They can go online at home and the parents can see exactly what the students are learning in the classroom. For example, one of the things we teach them in Frog Street is how to belly breathe and blow out the candles when they're feeling upset. So the parents can go online and they can see what belly breathing is when they're talking about it at the dinner table, and they can also have them do that when they're upset about something that doesn't go their way at home. They can belly breathe there as well. So that connection is really gonna be integral to success. It's got the language acquisition supports as I spoke about. It involves brain breaks, which we know our kids need a lot of those, a lot of movement, a lot of age appropriate play, and then you can't beat Franny the Frog. Franny the Frog is a big piece of Frog Street. She is in the classroom. She's part of every lesson. We change her outfit to go with the weather, it's a very big deal for the kids to have Franny the Frog along with them. Um, so really it's just learning through fun, but and it's really making sure the kids are ready for kindergarten. So you can see the total request for funds turned out to be $56,459.88. 
Um, each program per classroom that teases out to $3,699 per classroom. That is a comprehensive package. It doesn't, we do not need to rebuy every year. The curriculum will stand the test of time until we're ready to go through the process again. The only renewal will be the teacher portal. Um, included in that amount is the teacher renewal for the next five years. So the only piece that is not included in that request that we may want to consider in the future is that at home piece. I wanted to kind of test that out. We talked about it and we thought we want to see how much the parents are using that and if that really is worth the extra funds each year. Um, so we did not include that in the next upcoming years, but it's included in this year. Um, and the other counties that are using Frog Street are Caroline, St. Mary's, Wacomico, and Somerset at this time. Any questions regarding Frog Street? No, anybody? Not from me. Do you want to see what belly breathing looks like? No. <laughs> <laughs> Blowing out candles, all Take the things. Vote. Dandelions, <laughs> breathing, we got it all. All right. Okay, so moving on to K to five. So the K to three rubric that teachers had to use was worth a total of 104 points because K to three teachers did have to look at that science of reading piece. Grades four to five teachers did not. So the K to three rubric was out of 104 points and you can see the averages of our, of those three products for K to three teachers um, with interreading by HMH coming out on, on top numerically uh, or quantitatively with 89 points. In grades four and five, um, again, into reading, HMH did come out on top from a quantitative perspective, averaging 87 points on the rubric with all those seven components that I showed you a little bit earlier. So we surveyed kids, because our students, because they are the most important stakeholders. So in K-2, what that looked like is we rolled out a Google survey to the K-2 piloting teachers, and we had the teachers work with their kids to get answers, and then the teacher inputted the answers. Um, we had about four of those classrooms respond to this survey. We didn't force the K-2 teachers to do this with their K-2 guys, but four of them did it, and this is what came out from our K-2 year olds. Um, would you like to take? Sure. So if you look at the um, overall scores, you can see that there was a clear winner with intro to reading with 75% of the students choosing that. Wonders was at 25% and none of the students chose my view, which was interesting. Some of the things that the kids said, I mean, you, from the mouths of our babes, right? The stories were funny. They liked the illustrations. There are more stories inside the decodables. So when they go to the back table, they knew they were going to get more stories. They liked that they could read the words. They loved that they were reading longer stories because that's more mature. The graphics and bigger pictures in the stories were attractive to them. Um, they liked the read alouds. They, they brainstormed. They were writing. They could write. And they really loved that they could write in the workbooks. That was a really big deal to them, that they could take their highlighter and they could mark it up they could find words they know they could circle things that that made them feel like they really owned that book um, they love that you get to write in the stories I learned more more in that one it was more fun lots of cool stories in that one and the stories felt more real to them all right, so for our three to five, fifth grade, third to fifth graders, they, we actually sent the Google survey out to them, their teacher did, um, and so we got 101 third through fifth graders to respond. Um, and almost 65% of them chose into reading with wonders coming in second and my view placing third. Now here's my favorite part. Here's what the kids had to say. So one of our third graders said, because I like the stories and to highlight, and it's my mom's favorite color. <laughs> the color of the third grade book was purple. So I really don't think you can be taking your mom's favorite color into account when you're picking something. <laughs> Another third grader, because the purple book had one of my favorite books, Scaredy Squirrels. So a lot of these anthologies have excerpts or chapters from chapter books, um, which is so important for our third graders to get, to get, to get exposure to, to chapter books. Um, and another third grader said, I like this book because it had kid-friendly stories. Um, sure. What a kind of a sixth grade thing to say, but I thought that that was really well said. Um, and I'm not going to show you all 101 of them. I just picked out some great ones. And then we had a fourth grader who liked the great stories and the questions. And I, so I pulled out comments that kind of had reoccurring themes. And I saw the question piece come up on it a lot. There were a lot of higher level questions um, in these consumables. Um, and that played out well with student conversation um, in these classes. 
Um, I love the academic vocabulary in this next response. I liked the HMH book because it had so many very interesting different genres. So they're exposed to that word genre repeatedly throughout the book. It'll say genre play, um, genre nonfiction. Um, and uh, this student must have really enjoyed being part of the plays. And then they wrapped it up with a concluding sentence. That is why I like the HMH <laughs> book. Uh, and then we had a fifth grade student who, you know, because we could write in it instead of using sticky notes. So they're learning how to annotate. So what's different from this book than our prior books is the students get actual consumables, books that they can open up and write right in, and they're theirs. They're theirs to take home at the end of the year, in the evening. So in our current textbook, they they got to share those with everybody so that they can only use stickies. So I really loved seeing that our kids love being able to, to get into the text and, and mark it up with, with pen um, or pencil. Mm -hmm. All right, so what those 19 teachers voted for, or the 17, the 17 that went for K to Thai, they voted for interreading. So interreading was the clear winner here um, with 80% of the vote going to that product. So that we had teachers share their rationale and here's where you're going to see a lot of that the teachery words here but we're really heartened to see from our kindergarten first second and third grade teachers a lot having to do with the science of reading phonics phonemic awareness um, and there's a lot of great online components that come with this product um, for our teachers and for kids when they're in their independent rotation uh, it aligns well with the science of reading and letters. Um, the first teacher we uh, awarded tonight, Jennifer Osborne, is becoming a letters trainer. Um, that's really important in regards to Blueprint um, as well. So we will work to get all of our teachers letters trained. And this product aligns very nicely and cleanly with it. Second grade teacher, teacher noted the writing program, um, had nice alignment to what kids were reading. Uh, another third grade teacher remarked on the plethora of online resources. And there's a really important piece here. The slideshows were pre-made. And with the, our, our elementary teachers do get an hour of planning for all of their contents. It's so important whenever a company can already provide you with a slide deck that you can use with kids, that just saves our teacher valuable time so they can divide themselves among those other contents um, to make sure they're covered for the next day. Um, a fourth grade teacher remarked on writing teacher charts or teaching pal and the anchor resources that we have that uh, HMH has and then a fifth grade teacher we had one fifth grade teacher pilot um, so we were thrilled to see that she noted mentor text and the writing tasks as well so lots of great teacher justification as to why they chose the product so let's get back to money. So all of the companies um, uh, whose products we used did write quotes for a six-year contract. That's great news. That's great news. We had the budget to support a six-year contract. Uh, into reading what the teachers ultimately cho chose, we have um, money for, for a six-year contract. Um, a little over 322 coming from Maryland Leeds. So Maryland Leeds can only support K through three. Mm -hmm. Um, and from our FY23 budget, um, close to 342,000. So we're in a safe place from, from, from a financial perspective um, of spending those dollars. When you combine that with Frog Street, which um, Ms. Cox shared with you the total of as well, um, we are in a very safe space, still having room in uh, fiscal year 23. Um, we'd like to look at bringing, um, bringing more trainers here for the actual implementation day. Um, Ms. Cox and I have some other ideas for the remaining dollars in, in science of reading, which we'll talk to Dr. Sprenkel about very soon. So we're in good shape from a financial perspective. The other counties that are using into reading, it's been purchased in Prince George's, Charles, Frederick, and Howard. And right now, Wacomico and Baltimore County are piloting it. So at this point in time, I'm gonna ask if the product can go out for a 30-day read. What that means is we're gonna put the materials in all of our elementary school front offices, as well as the board front office. And if anybody has any comments or concerns, any of our stakeholders who view it, they can email Ms. Cox or me. Um, we'll review those and then we'll, if you allow to go out for a 30-day read, we'll come back in April to, uh, to move this to an action item. All right, <clears throat> and uh, I note that we've got a couple copies here, right? And the, yes, for the, the board members to take a there. look at. Yep, to take a look at. All right, um, do we actually need a vote on this or? It's just information. Okay, no, this well. is information. No, okay. So now, when um, you say you're gonna have this in each school, will it also be on our website? So the materials aren't 
their ac the actual physical materials. So I can certainly get a link to the HMH site to put on our, our website. Um, and I, I just think if somebody it's not in our schools or needs a, would like to look at this, at least have access to where they could sure. go get to it. That would be my concern. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to help. I'll do that. And then if so they we go might, into I mean, not, there's a lot of, I think we heard tonight, retired educators that might have some input that could help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. there's sure. yep, a lot of good stuff. So we'll, we'll get that link up on the front page of our website and we'll have several materials in all of our elementary schools. All right, so I guess it goes through a 30 day read, right? Thank you, ladies. All right, all right. thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much, that was great. Okay, next up is Blueprint Implementation Plan Update, Dr. Kibler. And you have to make this as fun as Fanny the Frog. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I'm up for that. Uh, we'll cut you some slack. I can try. <laughs> we'll cut you some slack. Yeah. Time means everything, you know? Yeah, sometimes right. you're just Fanny, behind the bus and sometimes Fanny you're not. Fanny the Frog. All right, I'll have to ask my little guy about that because he was part of that pilot. There you go. So good evening, President Schifanelli, board members, Dr. Salins and executive team, uh, Dr. Matthew Kibler, and I'm Director of Accountability and Implementation. And I'm here tonight to give you all um, and the, the public um, an update on our blueprint implementation plan for Queen Anne's County Public Schools um, <clears throat> and our approach to our, our first plan. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the plan. The rough draft is posted on board docs. Um, that, that you can look at if you want. It's a, it's a long document, almost 200 pages. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit, just remind the board uh, the different, the five pillars of the blueprint and talk a little bit um, about each of the pillars and the approach that we're taking here in Queen Anne's County in this first iteration of an implementation plan, how we're, um, how, how we're sort of proceeding. So the first of the five pillars is the early childhood education pillar. And that's what, um, where we see the expanded um, access to full day pre-kindergarten classes. Um, and that includes both three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Uh, the, the plan does allow us to pick one of two approaches. That is, we can focus on tier one, um, three-year-olds and four-year-olds. So those are children that come from families that make less than 300% of the federal poverty level. So we could, we could focus on those two, three-year-olds and four-year-olds at first, or we could take the approach where we try to get as many of our four-year-olds in the district into our schools as possible with the first, um, first priority to those tier one children. And we are taking that approach of trying to get as many four-year-olds in the district as possible first before we start going to the tier one three-year-olds. Um, if you remember, we talked about this last year, we started a three-year plan to get full day pre-K in each of our elementary schools that offer pre-K. We are currently in the first year of that three-year plan. That's still moving forward. We're really excited about it, but that's that, um, that first pillar. And I do want to say, even though we're working right now on the tier, um, on the four-year-olds over the next few years, we will still have to address the three-year-olds as well, unless legislation changes. That's the tier one three-year-olds. But um, for now, they're sort of um, waiting as we do the four-year-old plan. Pillar two, our high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. This is really about recruiting and retaining high quality and diverse teachers and administrators. That's uh, what that leader piece means. You've heard and the public has heard about this career ladder. The career ladder is in this second pillar. Uh, with our approach in the blueprint right now, we are very, very fortunate to be in a two year contract with all of our uh, bargaining units. So for now, we're really observing other districts learning more ourselves about the blueprint and the requirements and trying to put a plan into place of how we can work with our education association and our administrator and supervisor association in the coming year to approach the career ladder here in Queen Anne's County. So it's really in the planning stages right now of how we're gonna do that. Pillar three, the college and career readiness pathways. 
including career and technical education, our CTE programs. Really, that's, that pillar is focusing on academics. It's the largest of the five pillars. It's really the academic program. I will say the blueprint right for now, when we talk about academics, it's looking at English and math and the curriculum there from K to 12, as well as our post CCR, the college and career readiness pathways. So trying to get our students college and career ready by the end of their 10th grade year and then focusing on their next pathway, be that uh, dual enrollment, AP, CTE classes and expanding those programs. In this pillar, we're working very hard with both Chesapeake College and our Upper Shore Workforce Investment Board on college and career counseling. So that's all in this pillar. That, it's really a lot. <laughs> it could almost be three or more pillars on its own, frankly. The fourth pillar, more resources um, to ensure all students are successful. So pillar three was the academics kind of in the classroom, the, the educational program. Pillar four is the supports. It's looking at um, support of EL students, specifically our special education students, social and emotional supports as well. So our student services area as well. There is also a large portion, if you look at the rough draft, that focuses in this pillar at, on community schools. Queen Anne's County Public Schools right now, we do not have any schools that meet the blueprints definition of a community school, meaning that none of our schools are in the threshold of, a con of being able to receive a concentration of poverty grant. Because we don't have any schools like that right now, we are not responding to the to those community schools, um, those questions. So if you, if you all notice that, or if any members of the public watching this notice that and wonder why we are basically writing non-applicable applicable right now is because we don't have them. We're supposed to comment on what we're doing, but we're not doing anything there. Now, with that said, if you've heard the terms community schools, we do have three schools already with our new health centers that are close to meeting really the requirements of what would be in a community school. So if any of those schools would become um, eligible for that concentration of poverty grant, we would be pretty much right there. There's a couple other requirements that go along with it if we get that, including like hiring a, a staff member uh, to be a community school coordinator for those schools, but um, we'll get that funding. If, if that happens, we'd be well positioned to, to pivot that way if that happens. Pillar five, the governance and accountability. That's really how we here in the district are implementing the blueprint, how we're planning to implement the blueprint. So that's where we're talking about uh, who's writing the plan, how we're getting feedback, who's monitoring implementation, and how we're gonna continue to work and plan uh, to roll out the blueprint in Queen Anne's County Public Schools for the next decade till 2032 as, as the date goes. So here's a little bit about the timeline. This is all just, this is, this timeline is not around the blueprint in general. This is around the implementation plan that we are required to write here in Queen Anne's County. AIB adopted the initial blueprint comprehensive plan. So how the whole state is going to function under the blueprint on December 1st. That December 12th through 22nd, we kind of learned from the accountability and implementation board, that's the AIB, excuse me, um, in conjunction with the Maryland State Department of Education, we kind of learned what the requirements were gonna be for local education agencies, this first implementation plan that we have to write. We've really worked hard so far here in um, the staff um, working on our rough draft. You can see we met with individuals that were going to be working on the implementation plan the first week of January. We had a check-in in mid-January. We had an internal deadline of a rough draft on February 3rd. We then met with MSDE, the Maryland State Department of Education, and representatives from the Accountability and Implementation Board, the AIB, on February 17th, where they offered some comment on our rough draft and where we were at the time. It was good feedback, um, nothing, nothing surprising. We were doing a great job. We were really on point. They basically asked, hey, can you elaborate, expand in some areas, give us some more examples, all of which we're actively working on right now. The draft that is posted um, um, right now on board docs is, is really al already out of date because everybody's still working hard on this. Um, and, and we'll continue to work hard on it until we um, submit this on March 15th. I, sh I could have probably included 
a couple extra days after we submit on March 15th, um, AIB representatives and, and MSDE, MSDE representatives that will be sort of grading or scoring these plans, they'll go over them, they will submit them back to us, and we will work back and forth until roughly June, that's the hope across the state, that all local education ag agencies in the, in the state will have accepted plans. The reality of this is it's not, we don't, we don't turn it in and then gets and it's either it's accepted or it's not, it will be accepted eventually. There just might be some back and forth after that March 15th deadline. So we're excited about um, where we're going. It's a lot of work. I, I'll come back eventually and name all the individuals that, that have helped because we want to make sure we publicly thank everybody that's working on it. Um, again, the draft implementation plan is posted on board docs right now. This is the first of three implementation plans we're going to have to write. Initially, we were gonna to have to write one to try to project out for 10 years while we were still learning about it. I would just remind you all and anybody listening that, that will look at it. This first plan, we are supposed to talk about how we are planning to implement the blueprint in Queen Anne's County. So again, you will not open up and look in pillar two and find the career ladder for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. We're talking right now about how we're going to approach building a career ladder for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Next year, we will have to submit our second plan roughly in March again. That will be more detailed about the actions we're actually taking around the five pillars. And then we are scheduled four to five years later to submit a third and final submission of an implementation plan to sort of fill out the last remaining five years of the blueprint. So that's a lot in a short time. I'm happy to, to take any questions. We've been trying to really keep you abreast of, of, of this as we go along. Um, but I don't know if anybody has questions. Questions? Uh, anybody? Uh, yeah. My only, not a question, a concern is <clears throat> the cost and then where the funding comes from. And it's good to have all these plans. Yeah. If it's going to be thrown strictly to the local level, yeah. we got problems if the state's not considered to be a, be a heavy partner in this. But I know I'm, I, I'm talking to the choir here. I mean, this is, we're, we can all get on that. I mean, we all top five can agree on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's, I think it's gonna be a, a very interesting thing process because the cost could be catastrophic, I think. Absolutely, 100%. And we're facing major issues now. Now, yes. And you know, the, the unfunded mandates that come with many of the buckets that Dr. Kibler were talking about, such as your nationally board certification for teachers. We, you know, that's $260,000 price tag, but we get reimbursed about 140. Um, all of your pre-K expansion stuff, they give us some funds, but we have a lot of work to do and to get accredited um, and everything that we have to do to do that. It's, it's very extensive. Um, and then of course, dual enrollment's another one that goes with the, the CCR bucket. Um, you know, typically that was about $15,000 a semester for us. Um, this year, it's going to run about 60 grand a semester. Next year, it'll be more um, as we add additional costs um, as students take access to dual enrollment courses. Now, don't get us wrong, we're doing everything we can to work with the colleges. We have a good relationship with them, um, looking at all kinds of options from teaching those courses right on our campus to buying class sets so that we don't have to go into textbooks every single time. Um, expansion of CTE programs is going to be expensive. Uh, so yeah, there's some big time concerns as um, these mandates come come down, and while they give us some funding toward it, that foundational money is not enough to support it. If when we do like dual enrollment and things like that, do we have any teachers either from Chesapeake or Washington coming to our campuses to teach? We're working on that right now, and those are some of the strategies that we're trying to implement as we gear up for next school year of how do we. Um, get more of their professors to be part of using our campuses so that we don't have to do transportation costs. Again, doing class sets so that every individual student doesn't have to purchase a book. And then if we purchase the book and then do they own it or do we own it? And so we're trying to work through all of those right now. Um, but the overall, and I'll get to my budget this evening, the overall challenges um, you know, continue to be those blueprint mandates that are coming down the pike, as well as inflation, as we all know, um, as well as declining enrollment. So those are probably our three largest challenges to our budget. And I, I think right now that the Accountability and Implementation Board has signaled that they don't want to they don't want to pause on rolling this plan out right now. They want to wait and and 
sort of see what happens as we as we kind of keep approaching. So I'm expecting a, a big year next year as we continue to like look at the 10% increase in teacher salary. That's a, blu a blueprint mandate. Um, CFOs around the state start really putting more numbers around what budgets are going to look like as we approach the $60,000 starting salary for teachers. And I, I think looking at that collectively around the state, coupling with declining enrollment, inflation, fuel costs, and things like that. Rising insurance costs. Right. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yes. Um, but because some of those deadlines are down the road, the, the AIB was just signaling, we, we're not going to stop. We need to press to this. And, and, yeah. That's that's what we're fighting, not fighting, but that's and, what we're doing. You know, we discuss this ourselves in, in, in budget hearings, but when you talk of sixty thousand dollar for starting yeah. teachers, that's not sixty thousand dollars for starting teachers. That generated up the whole scale because it's you know you're just not going to move them. You're going to move everybody's got to move unless you're going to have people pass everybody. And I, I just. It's and almost then like we build a boat and see if we can float. I mean, I'd rather, you know. I think another concern that we all share together is that the blueprint really is focused on um, certificated staff. And so we can't lose sight of our support staff mm -hmm. and our administrators. And that's the most challenging part in and of itself. So while we are getting some foundational money, we have to remember that it's really only for our certified staff members, which is about 650-ish um, out of about 1,350. So Happens. we have a lot, yeah, we have a lot that are on the opposite side of that that are not impacted at all or supported by the blueprint. But they've got to be picked up. I exactly. mean, I think we did that in our past year. Right. Really worked at our different, yes. you know, uncertified people too because it's a team effort. Correct. And, and nobody works, unless we work together, it's not going to go. Right. So, Dr. Kibler, I think uh, one reason we don't have a lot of questions is because you've kept us up to date, <laughs> yeah, for the, seriously, for the last yeah. year mm -hmm. on how this has been rolling out and waiting on the state and all that stuff. So the budget issues, I'm sure they figured that all out with the Kieran Commission, Kirwan and... Uh, Kerwin. Kerwin, <laughs> yeah. Kirwan, Kerwin. and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we're working and we'll be sure to keep um, keep you up to date on what's happening as, as we get to that March 15th deadline and then the back and forth that we know will occur. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. He's going to stay up there, I think. Yep. I do have a question about oh, sure. the AIB board. Who is that comprised of? Are there representatives from? There are seven members on the accountability and implementation board. They are appointed by the governor. Um, it's supposed to be a representative sample of people from around the state. There, it really, and this was something we talked about last year, um, that this first seven members there is no representation from anybody on the Eastern Shore or rural counties in Western Maryland either. Basically, every member comes from Central Maryland, the, the large the large counties, Baltimore City and Arundel County, um, Howard County, PG County, I believe, and I'm okay. probably forgetting. But unfortunately, no, there was no representation. And I hope I don't misspeak, but I believe that they've just opened up to fill additional positions and that I, I think that uh, Commissioner Smith email has nominating. Yeah. Yes. Sure. And we supported him in, in, in that. So hopefully we, you know, hopefully he will be accepted and um, we will have some good representation. He is very much on the pulse of the blueprint, very much a supporter of education and very much a friend to us here at the board. And so we really hope that he has that opportunity. And I should say publicly too, just in, in case it gets out. So the, the AIB members themselves, they recognized that they, they weren't necessarily representative of the whole state. So one thing that they supported as a recommendation from concerned school systems is they started advisory committees for each of the five pillars of the blueprint to kind of give them advice on the implementation of the plan in the whole state. And they, they did get a nice cross section of representatives for each um, pillar um, on those advisory committees. I believe there are three individuals from right here around Queen Anne's County and Talbot County that are on a couple of those pillars. I think we have two folks that are on, they're not affiliated with our school system, but they live in the area that are on uh, pillar three, so the, the curriculum committee. Um, and I think it's pillar two is where the third individual is. So I, I do, respect and, and want to thank the AIB for, for recognizing and, and putting those committees together. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Policies reviewed and reaffirmed. Sure. So 
you may remember that I, I brought another list of policies um, that were reviewed by individuals um, in the district in February. The difference this month with this list of policies is these were on an old format. So from like the early 2000s, like 2000 ish to 2010 or 12. And all we did with these policies is just put them on the new format. There is no change to any language or anything like that. It just now looks trying to standardize over the next four years. But I, I felt like in fairness to you all, I just I wanted to bring them in. In, in two separate groups just to share with you again just like last month we don't believe these need a vote um, but i wanted to show that there is a slight difference from from the group that we brought last month that were reaffirmed but they've been reviewed and yes in compliance. so on the calendar basically what what we did was uh these policies were given to the areas to the offices responsible reviewed and said they don't need any changes except put them on our new format please so again after this four year first four-year calendar that first iteration of a four-year calendar all the policies will be on our standard format now okay all right any questions thank you thanks sir so we're at 6.05 first read policy 415 employment of substitute teachers dr no <clears throat> Mr. President, Dr. Salins, members of the school board and executive team, for the record, my name is Michael Knoll. I am the Director of Human Resources, and I am here to speak with you ever so briefly about the update and new format for Policy 415. It has not been updated since 2013, and some things changed in 10 years with how we did business in the substitute hiring. Uh, we no longer are a paper and pencil program. We now have a full electronic application process and onboarding process for our substitutes, but all of the other background check and screening and things of that nature are still in full force for that. So there's not a whole lot of change needed, but I bring before you tonight a first read of this before it goes out for public comment. And I plan to return in April for a second read for this policy before we make it living in the third read. Happy to answer any questions about this riveting policy change. <laughs> any questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Noll, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, it's sweet. 6.06, .06, expenditure status reports. Ms. Jane Towers. I'm a money lady. <laughs> Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Tower, CFO for the district. And tonight we bring before you your expenditure report in detail and in summary for your review. Are there any questions? Only, the question I had, I already talked to you once about it, but it was in the, you know, category one thousand or 11. They were short, but you said there will be a, yes. a shift in that coming in front of us shortly. Right. Um, repurposing of two positions. Correct. Any questions? No questions. It's moving on. All right, keep going. So, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, summary for your review. Item of note, ESSER 2 is ending September 30th. The only fund still left in there is some operational um, type supplies as well as some indirect costs. Spend out. ESSER 3 is going to, um, we have in salaries encumbered for 24 to include those permanent substitutes and a couple other additional positions in there. There's no ESSER 4 on the horizon. Not that we're hearing, no, I'm sorry. All kinds of things are being cut <coughs> these days. And as of today, there's a lot of things that no longer exist from the COVID monies. Thank right. you. No more questions. Thank you. Uh, we're scheduled for a break. Do we want to take a break or to keep going? Keep going. 
Keep going. Let's keep keep going. going. Seems to be our modus operandi. All right, mm -hmm. 8.01, Human Resources and Substitute Bus Driver Report. Is that Sid? Mm -hmm. I recommend no, we recommend uh, right. we approve the oh, Human Resources okay. Report as substantially in closed session. All right, I have a motion second. and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 ABI SPL Zoom Education License Contract Renewal. Mr. Combs. Good evening, President Finelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. I'm here today to ask for purchase approval for licensing for Zoom. It's uh, the virtual platform that we use for students by student services uh with hht or home yeah. is that, mm -hmm. did i say that right yes yeah. um Good job josh <laughs> trying to make sure i get all these acronyms yeah. um <laughs> yeah ans uses it we do it for parent virtual nights um you know and in order for the reason why we have the pay uh product is because you have to get uh the basic free version, you're limited 40 minutes and all the other things. So with security and single sign, no one in ease, okay. we need the license version. And this has been the second or third year we've been using this product. So Pretty the much in virtual. Sorry. Yeah, what? Done. The license version gives you, uh, it's so many hours that you can do, but it's an unlimited license for the district? Uh, it's, well, we have a 1,000, we're asking for a 1,000 license, which covers basically all of our teachers okay. and faculty. Gotcha. Students, we don't need license for. Right. So that one-to-one, -one, we don't need it on their side. All right. Any questions? It's budgeted for ESSER 3, right? Yes, sir. All right. And it's superintendent endorsed. Do I have a motion? Uh, I'd like to submit a motion to accept the board approve the AVI SPL Zoom Education License Contract Renewal for district-wide use fiscal impact $25,000 budget source ESSER 3. Second. All right, we have a motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Mr. Combs. Okay, 8.03, here we go to budget approval, Ms. Towers. Thanks, Ms. Towers. I asked, I asked Ms. Towers to come up just in case I uh, need some guidance, need but I'm going to go ahead and try to take the lead on this just for a right. second or two. Get my calculator out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, board, I do come before you with um, our, our budget now. I do want to make some comments first that um, we have our revenue from um, projections from the state level um, came out um, at $1.3 million. Uh, we got a second iteration of that last Friday at um, a cut of that, so, so now it's $670,000. Um, very concerning for us overall, as we just talked about all of the things with the blueprint, some unfunded mandates, and some um, pretty big concerns as it relates to um, the 10% that Dr. Kibler spoke of, as well as the $60,000 starting salary that we just discussed. Um, you know, within that foundation money uh, that comes with Blueprint, your salary information, your salary funds come out of that. And so that's why we're concerned because we don't have enough of that foundation money to meet that. As you well know, um, uh, with our two-year contract um, and our report from the Public Labor Relations Board, um, we had to use fund balance this year in order to uh, balance our budget and provide salary enhancements to our staff. And that is not sustainable through fund for, through using um, one-time funds. So coupling that with um, the additional enhancement for the upcoming year um, is concerning. Um, we have consistently met with our commissioners and I have to say publicly that uh, we could not have better partners. They have been extremely supportive of us they ask great questions. Um, we meet often and I'll continue to meet with them. We have a meeting this week scheduled with them um, and just to continue to make sure that we're working together to try to meet the budget needs of the district. So you will see that the state revenue number um, is basically $41 million. Um, you'll see that that most updated recent of $670,000. And just a little side note that there was uh, 11 districts who were cut significantly in their monies um, and CFOs um, 
immediately uh, reached out to MSDE. Uh, MSDE had a special technical session, um, but at the end of the day, the numbers, they were um, very stern that the numbers were what they were, that they will not change. Last year at this point, if you recall, we had several reiterations of the numbers over and over again until almost nearly June. Um, so they're saying that these numbers are stable and that this is what we will get and that's $670,000. Um, for the county, uh, in working with the budget team as, as, as um, pretty hard and significant, we've come up with, again, a placeholder. We're using that, that, that terminology, placeholder. If you remember last year, we did too. Um, because we're really unsure of some of the other fundings that are coming down, but we're, we're basically meeting with the commissioners and saying in order to meet our expectations for our salary enhancements and the other needs as it relates to fuel costs, higher dual enrollment costs, um, to, to fill the gaps for nationally um, board certification, to, um, to expand the, our pre-K programs, um, to combat the declining enrollment, to put in you know, for our inflation, um, all of those things put together um, are, are concerning. So we've come up with a placeholder number, which is $4.8 million. So that is what we have shared with our commissioners. Um, as we look at those total unrestricted revenue sources, you see that's at about $1 million. As we move down to our more uh, looking at kind of the cost of doing business and some restrictions and things like that, or where do we have to make some adjustments, in the positive, which is good, is salary lapse. So as our, um, our more mature staff members move on to retirement, um, then when we bring in um, younger, younger staff members that don't have the same exact price tag, we're able to see some savings there. And so we've been able to do that. Um, and then some uh, reduction of some supplemental instructional materials there. And then we have the section of the cost of doing business. These are things really completely out of our control. Um, state mandates to, that are forcing us into um, to adding services. For instance, I know we briefed you earlier on in the school year about some changes to our um, mandates for, as it relates to athletic trainers and their availability uh, 12 months out of the year. So those monies are there um, as a placeholder to address uh, our two athletic trainers that will need to be with us 12 months out of the year. Um, the leasing vehicles is actually saving money. That, that's a strategy for us to save money long term. Um, we know that fuel costs continue to go up. That continues to come to you in budget amendments. Overall allocation of maintenance of effort, um, some things that we just can't control. Um, as well as those health care supplies that, um, again, that, that those that $5,000 is a mandate by the state, an unfunded mandate through legislation. And then the biggest part is our health care and insurance rate. So um, we are projected to have an increase of 8.8%, um, and that is the health care premium cost. Um, so we're at 8.8%. Last year, you approved and used 1.6% in reserves to try to get that original number down. Um, but we did have a plus claims over premium paid, which was at a rate of $3.2 million. And so we really cannot go into our reserves at this time um, to try to bring that 8.8% down. Um, if we didn't have that claims over premium, I think we would be able to consider taking some, but at this point, that would not be my recommendation. And so the board's portion of the increase at this time would be a million dollars. Um, and that, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So we gotta, we gotta take a hard look at that. Um, of course, your additions are your negotiated salaries that we've been talking about. And that um, overall enhancement um, needs to be put in the budget at $3.6 million. And then our future um, blueprint mandates, um, we've we kind of talked all about those costs already. And then um, the next section really is if we do have additional funds, we had that big, great money tree that was out back, mm -hmm. um, or if they do end up changing some legislation laws that impact um, the blueprint, which changes our foundation, which is, could happen um, if they come up with a hold harmless type of opportunity for us, that might free up some monies in our budget. And if that was the case, um, the budget team, which includes all of your administrators, um, meaning principals at the table and all of your CNI staff, your um, curriculum instruction staff, the top priority would be to add two guidance counselors. Um, the mental well-being of our students is our top priority right now. Um, and we know that this is a top need. 
And so that would be our top priority. The next one is a social studies supervisor. No, we're not getting rid of Adam Tolley. It's just that the blueprint has so many expectations for a CTE programming person that's dedicated to CTE programming that we have no choice but to have one person just focus on CTE, which is forcing us to take things off of Adam's plate to add an additional staff member there to take those responsibilities. There's quite a number of assessments in social studies at this time. And so we, we it, it's not, it used to be a non-assessed course. That's how we used to talk about social studies. It's not anymore. Not only do we have the assessments at the government level, but now we have assessments at the middle school level that are mandated. So we have to have a dedicated supervisor to that content area. Um, taking two teacher specialists at the elementary level, I think you probably recall last year, we did four elementary schools. Um, because our budget's very tight, we're proposing to do two more this year where we would take teacher specialist position and make that position actually an AP position. Some power school add-ons, um, some additional staffing for Centerville Elementary School, which is just really an increase. Um, Centerville Elementary School being our largest primary building has more um, basically enrollments than anybody else. <laughs> so they, they have to combat that and, and to have that additional staffing for the extra two months will help us to um, you know, be able to enroll students in a timely manner and, and help that staff there. Some school servers, um, last year when we came on board, we talked about um, the budget kind of missing some line items that we felt were really important. It's important to have a line item in the budget so that every year you can address that yeah. instead of waiting till the end of the year and saying, do we have money left? Then maybe we can buy some technology. Maybe we can update whiteboards. It's better to have a line item in the budget yep. so that we can say this year we have a, well, we have a five-year plan and this year these three schools are going to get new whiteboards or, and then that, that rotates through. So a couple of these are adding line items within the budget. And then the most important part that I know that actually Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith consistently brings us to back <laughs> to the table is we have, we have some things that are in the ESSER grants and we need to make sure that we sustain those into our regular budget. So it was great that they were there, but that cliff is coming. And if we don't include them in our budget, um, then they will inevitably go away. And so uh, these services are inc incredibly important to our staff and our students, which is our iReady. That's our diagnostic tool. It gives us our data, very specific data, um, and has some toolkits with it. I think the teachers and the administrators find it to be very valuable for uh, recognizing where our students are in their learning. Performance Matters, um, which again has been uh, used in our county for years, is a huge resource for our teachers and staff. Um, and then we have five positions um, this year um, that we are asking to, to get into the budget. And then next year, the rest of the those um, ones that are being uh, funded through ESSER, we would ask for those to come into the budget. So that's kind of a summary. Um, we do still have the big budget book. We have mm -hmm. all the details for you and down into the weeds and are happy at any time um, to, to address any of those other things. But this is more of a summary of what's changing out there. What does the board need to know about our budget? And the most important part is obviously that revenue source and uh, the, the needs of the district. Now, are we able to balance a budget? So um, with the support of the commissioners and hopefully um, funding this entire uh, placeholder, we would be able to meet our, our budget needs up to these proposed additions. And fingers crossed that we would have the ability to do those as well. But at this point, we do not. And um, if I could add to as well with the answer positions, one of the things in an important part of the budget process is looking at staff and how it is actually um, allocated throughout the school. So these positions will be <coughs> purpose positions that um, don't take a, um, it's an addition and a subtraction at the same time, so it nets to zero. So just want to um, let you be mindful of that, that it is actually a, a neutral impact as far as that. Well, you know, the one thing is glaring is the state's not stepping up. I mean, if you look at what they're giving us additional this year compared to what we're asking the county for, right? It's, absolutely, it's it, it, it's, 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 it's not even realistic. I mean, not that we can. It's just not. It's not right. But it's the way things go. The other thing I'm happy about, I talked to Jane about it. We're not using our fund balance. We got that out of there. Yeah, we got that out and, of there. You know, not that we. At some point, you can't use it. So and I'm glad to see we're out of there before we hit the button because of our policy of yeah. keeping a certain amount of fund balance because what we keep is not, to me, extravagant for if something that Mr. Pender comes up with, like a boiler or, 
you know, you know, something elevator, elevator. <laughs> elevator or something pretty, pretty, you know, you know. So I, 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 I do think we're being more responsible this year, even though we had to do it in the previous years, it wasn't a good idea. Well, I think it's really important for everyone. To, the reason that we have that policy in place is because we have to float a lot of money. Um, we have about $20 million worth of grants that filter through our system and we don't always get reimbursed right away. Um, as a matter of fact, our title grant, which is a pretty hefty grant, um, we just recently got um, started getting reimbursements from the start of the school year, seven months after we started spending money. So we, we can't be in a position that we don't have some type of a floater to be able to float those those um, monies in and out. And, and $20 million is a, is a significant amount of money. I mean, we're thankful for those grants. Um, but they do take a lot of time to manage and, and make sure that, um, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. No, we were talking about earlier, we have people, even with the, with the leads money we have, yes. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we've lost two people now that won't be doing that. I mean, yes. that's a big management problem when it you is. start looking at that because, you know, you do everything right, one thing wrong, then all of a sudden you're not going to get it. And that's, that's it's, you know. That's correct. I appreciate it. it looks. I'm not saying it looks good, but looks, yeah, look, right. looks, <laughs> looks, looks realistic, let me put it that way. Thank you. Now, do we need the to... Promotion? No, this is just the... This, oh. this is an action item, this actually. Action this item. is the budget that we would be taking to, to the, the commissioners. commissioners. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, sir. So we do need a motion. Mr. President, I move that we approve the Queen Anne's County Board of Education 23-24 school year budget as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Lori. No, thank you. Yeah, and thank your staff, because, I mean, it's a lot of work. To, I mean, you know, this isn't, I mean, we spend a lot of time in February, but you spend a lot of time in November, December, January, February, just to get to the point of where we are. Yes. You know, it, doing some deep diving. Yes, and it, it, just on a side bar note, um, Dr. Sprankle and I have been meeting with our secondary groups, and um, the topic has been budget, and sharing with the students how much our budget is and where those monies come from, and mm -hmm. they were just like they were just amazed at mm -hmm. they were saying things like a hundred thousand, right. five hundred thousand. Yeah. Dr. Sillins like no, a little That's more. That's a higher, <laughs> just a little higher <laughs> than that. Higher. But they were so appreciative to understand, and they really got that eighty-five percent of our budget are our people. Mm -hmm. They got that, and they understood it, and we started. We talked about. Um, they played a little game when we talked about um, in the game, it, it talked about morale, it talked about um, hype, and it talked about maintenance. So we tied those right to our budget. And we said, you know, we have the best teachers, we care about our teachers, we got to keep that morale up, and how do we do it? It's a tough thing to balance when you have a budget and 85% of that is staffing, but then you have the maintenance over here that you got to do. So we really had some great discussions with our students uh, as it relates to budget, and, and I think they got it, and, and so much so I thought, you know, we should do this with our administrators. I think they would have a fun time <laughs> with it too. So it was kind of great, but, um, but that was just a sidebar note. But it is, it is a serious thing. It is a, it's a very long process. Um, we spend a lot of hours together, but it's, it's all worth it in the long run when we can have a nice balance, balanced budget. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. thank you. All right. Uh, what do we got? Policy. Uh, nope. 302 approval. I'm um, waiting. Yeah. 104. Sorry, Ms. Towers is. Can... All right. <laughs> I think you're with us for the balance, right? Mm hmm. All right. Um, so, tonight we're being before you policy for the final read and approval policy 302 the school activities funds and management as of to date there's been no public comment on this any got a motion any questions comment mr president i move that we approve the queen Anne's county board of education policy 302 subject to final edits for format and style Second. All right. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Yep. The next one is policy number 303, gifts, bequests, donations, and solicitations. We bring for your final uh, review and approval with no comments on this as well. All right. No comments from the public. Any comments from the board? Okay. Right. Mr. President, I vote that we move to approve the Queen Anne's County Board of Education policy 303 subject to final edits for format and style. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. 
Towers, please continue. I hope I'm going in the right order. Um, I just dawned on me. Uh, 310, procurement of goods and services. Yep, you're on the right. Uh -huh. okay. um, for a final uh, read and approval with uh, no comments. Any board comments? All right, any board comments, questions, concerns? Mm -hmm. Mr. President, I move that we act, approve the Queen Anne's County Board of Education Policy 310, subject to final edits for format and style. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Employee travel, we bring before you Policy 315 for final review and for your approval tonight. No public comment. Okay, any comment from the board? Mr. President, I move that we approve the Queen Anne's County Board of Education Policy 315, subject to final edits and for format and stuff. Second. And, and just for knowledge, everybody, these have been looked at three times. So it's not like you know, the board has had three reviews of this. Correct. The public's have been out there for three times. So um, this is the final thing where it's coming to the end. We haven't had any um, you know, answers. Or board has answers and questions that have been answered. There are things, though. So. Correct. So after that disclaimer, any uh, comment from the board? Right. I moved. I think he's second already. Well, yeah, I moved second. Oh, did we argue? Mm -hmm. Yes. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Last one, I promise. Reimbursement of travel, 306, to rescind that because that is going to be included in our employee travel for 315. Uh, final appro approval for um, tonight for the board to, and no public comment on this as well. Okay, any comment? I move that we rescind the Queen Anne's County Board of Education Policy 306. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Towers. All right. Citizen uh, comment, public comment, citizen participation. Anybody? Seeing none? None. All right. Future meetings and events. Uh, March 15th, 2023 at 5 p.m. will be their regular work session. And then April 12th, 2023, 6 p.m. is the, uh, the next, next month's board meeting. Um, work session. Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I can make a motion. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.